everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, solo edition with yours truly. And today I want to unpack auto regulation. Let's discuss what auto regulation is supposedly, the benefits of auto regulation, the challenges of studying auto regulation, and what we don't know and want to know with future research. Um, this area of interest is important for the BFR space because there are a lot of purported claims made about auto regulation and a lot of oversights that are being made uh, in the body of research uh, and by researchers that are hindering our understanding of the actual impact that auto regulation may have on blood flow restriction. Let's dig in. Um, so I have my stuff over on the other screen here. So if I'm looking away, um, don't worry. But let's first start out with what we do think auto regulation actually is. And auto regulation, by definition, is the ability of a cuff to adjust the amount of applied pressure to the exercising limb. Uh, based on the phase of muscle contraction. I wrote about this um, in our 2023 paper published in Frontiers in Physiology, Beneath the Cuff, um, often underlooked and underreported device features uh, and characteristics uh, in Frontiers in Physiology, as I mentioned. And what people don't necessarily appreciate is that Autoregulation is a device specific feature, meaning that depending on the capability of the algorithm that is overseeing the amount of applied pressure to the limb based on the phase of muscle contraction, that ability to adjust that pressure is going to be um, variable. Let's, um, let's give an example. Well, um, in something like the Delphi, the Delphi personalized tourniquet device has a built-in uh, computer that, that, for all intents and purposes, when you contract your muscle, um, there is going to be an additional pressure that's exerted on the cuff from the underlying muscles. And that pressure is going to spike the overall pressure within the system. And by the system, I just mean the limb. Therefore, the Delphi cuff or the, the, the algorithm that's monitoring that senses that there is an, a change in what we call interface pressure. And that's the pressure from the cuff that's applied to the limb or the limb uh, that's applied to the cuff, right? It, it would honestly depend on the phase of muscle contraction. But it senses that. And as a result of that, it then says, or thinks or does, whatever you want to think about it in your algorithm, in your head, or the construction of the model in your head, it then says, all right, I need to dump out air to maintain a consistent interface pressure. So if our interface pressure in this, uh, in this cuff is set to be 100 millimeters of mercury, and during the concentric phase of the contraction, we now are getting that cuff pressure to be greater than 100. Well, then that algorithm is going to dump air out to maintain approximately 100 millimeters of mercury of pressure on the limb. And then as that, uh, the exercise goes into the eccentric portion or the, the, the phase where the muscle is elongating, and now there's not as much pressure from the underlying limb to the cuff, then that algorithm is going to sense that and it is going to then adjust the pressure by pumping out, by pumping in more air into the, uh, into the cuff to maintain that interface pressure. Now, if you have a very responsive device, you might not even sense the fact that the cuff is adjusting. So devices like the Matup Pro or the Delphi tend to have very high responsiveness 
So you might not even feel that the cuff itself is adjusting. And then you can then play it on the opposite end, where if you have a cuff that is not as responsive, then the pressure that's going to be applied to the limb is going to swing widely because the cuff is not going to be able to adjust for the different phases of muscle contraction as efficiently. You can see where I have concerns for this area of blood flow restriction, because if you're using a cuff that's not as responsive to auto regulation, and there are many cuffs that are out there on the market that have done auto regulation or have or are or, or currently able to auto regulate to varying capacities. If we have a device that is not as responsive, that may impact the acute and or longitudinal responses to blood flow restricted exercise. Now you take all of those together and you start in, inputting them into meta analyses. And now you're going to get further heterogeneity beyond just the amount of applied pressure. Now you have the amount of applied pressure, you have the, the, the amount of repetitions performed, and then you have the cuff itself, and then you have auto regulation. So BFR literature is heterog heterogeneous in that sense. That is part of the reason why we want to reduce the heterogeneity by using relativized pressures, right? So obtaining a personalized pressure, a limb occlusion pressure, or arterial occlusion pressure, whatever you're going you're gonna to state as your working definition for personalized pressure. Now you add autoregulation on top of that, and it really becomes challenging to, um, to really get to the bottom of the effectiveness of blood flow restricted exercise. Um, so autoregulation is something that is thought to because of the adjustment of the cuff during the different phases of muscle contraction. Autoregulation is thought to be something that could be a benefit <clears throat> from a safety aspect, at least. Um, and this might be important for populations that may have comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, things that physical therapists uh, frequently encounter as comorbidities in their practice. Thus, autoregulation should receive some attention in the literature. Ironically, though, um, there really isn't that many studies that have looked at autoregulation, and yours truly has published one of them or two of them um, and has a couple of other papers that should see the light of day by the end of 2024 that should help further um, our understanding of the impact of blood flow restricted exercise. But I want to go through the existing body of literature to give everyone context as to the nascency of the state of this uh, research. So the first paper, believe it or not, that actually looked at, in some way, shape, or form, autoregulation was by my colleague Luke Hughes in his PhD uh, in 2018. And what they did was they took, took 18 males and they wanted to look really at whether or not the interface pressure, right? The interface pressure is the pressure applied from the cuff to the underlying limb. They wanted to look at perceptual factors, how hard they're working, rating a perceived exertion, rating a perceived pain or discomfort, right? They're basically analogous. Um, how much, how hard they're working and rating a perceived discomfort is how much discomfort or pain has been elicited through the exercise protocol itself. And then they wanted to look at cardiovascular responses in, in, uh, in the sense of mean arterial pressure. And they, they wanted to investigate this during rest, 
as well as during different uh, or during exercise. So they took 18 individuals and they had them undergo three different conditions. They had, they used the Delphi personalized tourniquet device, which is capable of auto-regulation. They wanted to investigate the Hokanson device, which is a research-based tourniquet that is very frequently used in blood flow restricted research. And then they wanted to use a manual cuff that is pumped up to um, a particular pressure, right? That can determine a personalized pressure, a single chamber bladder system. They use the occlusion cuff in this example. And what they did was they had individuals exercise at a fixed repetition scheme, four sets, using 30 repetitions followed by three sets of 15 at 30% of the one rep max. And they looked at different pressures. They looked at 40%, they looked at 80%. And then they wanted to see, all right, well, for the interface pressure, medical recommendations for tourniquets suggest that you want to be within 15 millimeters of mercury for the amount of applied pressure relative to uh, amount of applied pressure to the limb relative to the set pressure. So if I, for example, pump up the cuff to a hundred millimeters of mercury, that would be the set pressure. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the interface pressure, which is the pressure that's applied from the cuff to the limb, the actual pressure that's applied is a hundred millimeters of mercury their cutoff was 15 millimeters of mercury. So that means that it would be clinically acceptable for a cuff to apply within 85 to 115 millimeters of mercury. That would be acceptable for the amount of applied pressure to the limb. And they looked at that with the three different cuffs. And what they found was <clears throat> that during resting conditions, the rapid inflator Hokanson device and the Delphi personalized tourniquet device were within the clinically acceptable limit of plus or minus 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, the manual cuff was not. And then they looked at it during exercise and they found that only the auto-regulated Delphi personalized tourniquet device was able to maintain a set interface pressure of within 15 millimeters of mercury. The rapid inflator during rest, uh, during rest was acceptable, but not during exercise. It exceeded that 15 millimeters of mercury. So the initial thought here is that the Delphi personalized tourniquet device that can auto-regulate, right? It is able to adjust that pressure. Whereas the rapid inflator Hokanson just rapidly inflates to the pressure and it sets it there and that's it. So it doesn't adjust during the exercise itself. And then of course the manual cuff doesn't adjust because it is just inflated, right? You pump it up, you get it to hundred millimeters of mercury, or in this case, 40 and 80% of the um, LOP. And then that's it, right? It doesn't adjust. So it makes sense that the set interface pressure would be uh, would be maintained in something or more likely to be maintained in something that adjusts the pressure versus the other two cuffs that don't. Then they wanted to look at, all right, what are the perceptual responses? And what they found was that during the later sets of the exercise, that the rapid inflator Hokanson and the manual cuff were significantly different than the auto-regulated cuff, uh, the Delphi personalized tourniquet device, that the Delphi showed lower pain and exertion scores, which seemed to indicate that at least in the lower body and this exercise protocol that they used, that the Delphi could... Um, limit the increases in RPE and RPD, suggesting that it's a more tolerable and potentially better from a compliance perspective on a long-term basis. So that's important because per perceptual factors 
have been labeled a barrier to blood flow restricted exercise. And we discussed that in our uh, Proceed Barriers to Blood Flow Restriction paper that was published in Frontiers in uh, Rehabilitation Sciences back in 2021. And then last, what they did was they looked at the cardiovascular response, the mean arterial pressure. And what they found was following exercise, the mean arterial pressure was higher in uh, one minute and five minutes in the rapid inflator as well as the manual cuff. But the personalized tourniquet device, the Delphi, showed a quicker return to baseline mean arterial pressures, indicating that it's better able to manage the cardiovascular uh, stress to exercise. And thus, this study then concluded that the Delphi is better at mitigating the excessive cardiovascular responses, the excessive perceptual responses, as well as um, being able to maintain the pressure to the limb versus the rapid inflator, as well as the manual cuff. And this was really the first study that did a good job at trying to begin the process of understanding the potential impact of autoregulation on acute responses to exercise. But the study has limitations in the sense that we didn't really directly investigate autoregulation in the study. Well, we, Luke and colleagues, didn't really investigate autoregulation directly because they used various cuffs that have different widths. So while the feature of the Delphi device is autoregulation, auto they didn't necessarily isolate autoregulation as, um, as a true variable uh, of interest. So this was in 2018. And until the next study was published, really, there was no in, there was no direct studies that have looked at autoregulation until the study that I collaborated on with uh, my colleague Edward Jacobs at the University of Ghent that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And the paper is entitled Investigating the Autoregulation of Applied Blood Flow Restriction Training Pressures in Healthy, Physically Active Adults, an Intervention Study Evaluating Acute Training Responses and Safety. Now, funny story. Um, I have been interested in, as I mentioned before, device features uh, because I teach with a number of different devices in our um, in-person BFR certification courses as part of the BFR Pro's master's series and master's workshop. So I've had a ton of experience with the Delphi, the MADUP, smart tools, um, fit cuffs, and a variety of other cuffs that are not capable of autoregulation. Um, so I kind of knew that based upon the, um, the responsiveness of the smart tools autoregulation feature, that it would be interesting to look at the responses to both a fixed and a failure repetition scheme. Fixed meaning the 30, 15, 15, 15 that was recommended by Patterson et al. And the failure routine that can give us uh, an indication of the, uh, the impact of BFR exercise, more, more importantly, autoregulation. And so the smart tools was actually a great device to try to figure that question out. Um, even though the responsiveness of the smart cuffs really left something to be desired, um, I think it was a way to make a variety of different features um, able to be accessible by the clinicians who couldn't necessarily afford the Delphi or couldn't afford the MADUP device. Uh, and so what, what's interesting about this cuff is because of the attachment that the cuff has to the computer, you can actually keep it plugged in and program it to auto-regulate, or you can unplug it after it inflates to the set pressure. And now it can perform 
non-autoregulated exercise. So I was kind of brainstorming this paper uh, for a while, but of course, I have don't have the resources to be able to do that. And I was lucky to connect with Edward on social media where we kind of shared a passion for blood flow restriction. And he was a super motivated PhD student and he has a massive paper that's coming out um, hopefully at the end of 2024, early 2025 on the use of blood flow restriction in knee osteoarthritis patients. But he um, was able to, during the COVID pandemic, um, shepherd this project. So he really uh, was the reason why um, autoregulation has received such interest um, in the literature because of his amazing work we were able to publish in British Journal of Sports Medicine. So this paper took 56 healthy men and women and it randomized them into a crossover design where they first went through fixed repetition schemes, either using non-autoregulated or autoregulated function with the smart cuffs at 60% of the limb occlusion pressure. And then the next two sessions were randomized into failure, non-autoregulated and autoregulated. And what, we've, what we did was we measured cardiovascular, so brachial blood pressures um, and mean arterial blood pressures, as well as perceptual factors, right? RPE and RPD as done before. And we wanted to look at delayed onset muscle soreness as well as safety. We wanted to know, was there any difference in the acute responses to exercise from a safety perspective? And so we tracked all of that. And what we found was really interesting. Number one, we really found that in a fixed repetition scheme, right, the 30, 15, 15, 15, and we used, by the way, 20% of the estimated one rep max, which I will get to after because it is a big limitation to this study. But we found that really there was no meaningful difference in fixed repetition scheme uh, protocols from a cardiovascular response or a perceptual response. Yeah, there was some small differences here, but really practically insignificant. But what we found from a what we found from the failure repetition scheme was quite significant. Um, what we found was that in the auto-regulated condition that the participants were able to perform significantly more volume, about 25% more volume than the non-auto-regulated condition. And they were able to do that with significantly less discomfort and exertion. So if you're reading that and you're not having any sort of um, sort of knowledge about hands-on use for the responsiveness of autoregulation, you would think that, hey, autoregulation allows the participants to do a lot more volume and it's more comfortable. We should absolutely do it. And in addition, we found that the delayed onset muscle soreness was less, which was, which was also very interesting. But what we also looked at was safety. And what we found was that there was a seven-fold increase. Well, we first found 16 adverse responses, and none of them were serious, right? They were, the majority of them were lightheadedness, which is something to consider when you're administrating BFR is because we can create a, a temporary vasovagal response from a quick deflation of the cuff as the blood rushes through the, um, rushes through the limb, to, um, to get to the exercising muscle. Now we're creating a situation where um, we could create that vasovagal response. But we did find 16 adverse responses of which seven, or at least there was, um, of which there was a seven-fold increase in the adverse responses in the fixed protocol relative to the failure. And there was a five-fold increase in the, no, wait, sorry. Um, 
we found that there was an adverse response of 7%. Okay. We found that there was approximately a three times increase in the relative risk of experiencing an adverse response in the non auto regulated versus the auto regulated condition. So while there was no serious adverse responses and there tended to be a greater response for um, auto regulated in terms of reduction in adverse responses, there's some things that we need to discuss. And my hypothesis for, for what we found here and what doesn't make it into peer review and publications is that I feel that because of the responsiveness of the auto regulation feature, meaning that the responsive is not necessarily in a good way, but in a way that um, is not as responsive as the Delphi, that the participants, when we had them exercise to volitional fatigue, and they did a ton of reps, um, on average, 199 reps versus 114, I believe, in the non auto regulated condition, um, over four sets. Um, that created a, a differential where it was like, okay, well, upon glancing without having any experience with the, with the, with the cuff, they're probably, the you know, auto regulation should be a beneficial feature, um, given that the participants could perform more volume. Now, what does this mean from a fixed repetition scheme for studies that are using the auto regulation? Well, it just means that. Um, if you're using the smart cuffs, that those participants are probably exercising further from fatigue than if they were doing it without auto regulation. Now, here are my thoughts on this study. Because of the lack of responsiveness of the auto regulation feature in the cuff, my hypothesis, and we didn't measure this, so this is something that definitely needs more research in the future, but my hypothesis was that, um, that the participants were able to perform more volume and experience less discomfort because the blood flow was able to be restored to the limb between the phases of muscle contraction. Because if the autoregulation feature in the eccentric is delayed, well, then, then that reduces the amount of pressure applied to the limb. And conversely, in the concentric phase, right, it, it, it doesn't apply as much pressure, right? So, so now you're getting this differential in set interface pressure that might be significantly different from the uh, Delphi condition, for example, like if I was going to give, uh, if I was going to exercise with a Delphi because of that responsiveness. So this doesn't make it into publications because it's challenging to, to kind of report. It relies predominantly on practical experience dealing with cuffs like this. So what did we find? Well, we concluded that autoregulation appears to enhance safety and performance in both fixed and failure BFR training programs. Auto BFR training did not seem to affect the cardiovascular stress differently, which is perplexing by the way, but was associated with lower DOMS, perceived effort and discomfort. If you're a practitioner then reading this, you're like, all right, all for autoregulation. But I just wanna caution that when you're studying devices that might not necessarily be as responsive, this may lead to divergent results. And that's really what led us into our next investigation with autoregulation, where we looked at the Delphi personalized tourniquet device, and which has the, the better responsiveness for autoregulation. And we looked at that relative to the Delphi device that's programmed without the auto regulation function. So what we did was we uh, contacted Delphi because we wanted to um, specifically investigate the auto regulation function in their cuffs. And they needed to create a specialized option that's not commercially available to be able to um, set up where the cuff would inflate to a pressure, but not auto-regulate. And 
we then um, collaborated uh, with my colleague in Salisbury University, Tim Werner. He's an expert in arterial stiffness, and we were interested in combining both of our interests on blood flow restriction and his and arterial stiffness, mine and device features, where we designed a study that um, investigated autoregulation in a wall squat. And so we took the specialized tourniquets that were created uh, by Delphi and we put 20 men and women that are recreationally active into a three-armed protocol. So what we did was we had them exercise with no BFR, right, as the control condition, basically, um, that was exercising to volitional fatigue because we wanted to know, much like the Jacobs study, we wanted to know, does the Delphi accelerate fatigue with or without autoregulation relative to a low intensity control? But also, because that wasn't done, by the way, in the Jacobs study, we, we, they looked at autoregulation versus non autoregulation with the smart cuff, but they didn't assess it relative to a low intensity, uh, no BFR condition. We then were like, okay, Tim's interest in arterial stiffness and mine and device features, great. But my, my secondary interest has always been how can we make BFR more tolerable? So there is the idea that blood flow restricted exercise with autoregulation is more comfortable. We wanted to assess that. We then implemented rating of perceived exertion and rating of perceived discomfort. Uh, as our perceptual outcomes. And we looked at the supine blood pressure response um, to uh, brachial uh, blood pressures, mean arterial pressures. We also looked at central measures like um, uh, the pulse pressure, as well as arterial stiffness measured with the gold standard pulse wave velocity, carotid femoral um, for, for mostly central stiffness and carotid radial, which is thought to be more peripheral um, stiffness, just based on the fact that it's, it's not as centrally, um, centrally located, like carotid to femoral has to go all the way through the aortic trunk. Um, so it's thought to be a little bit better of a measure of central stiffness. So we had these individuals exercise um, with a non-autoregulated Delphi and an auto-regulated Delphi, they were blinded, so they didn't know um, what condition that, that they were in in the BFR group. But they were uh, 23 years old, there were seven females, and we included participants that were 18 to 40, physically active, weight stable for six months, and the females had to report uh, two years of regular menstruation. So we had all these individuals then exercise with a wall squat that was at 60% of supine limb occlusion pressure and at 20% of their uh, estimated one repetition maximum. So we used four sets to volitional failure and we defined that as inability to perform the technique to specification, inability to maintain cadence. So we used a two second, two second uh, cadence, which is a little bit slower uh, than the um, than what what other studies have used, but within the recommendations from Patterson et al. Um, of one to two seconds, and we had individuals do wall squats on a slide board. So they, there was basically a frictionless uh, platform uh, that they were able to do, and we had them just exercise as much as they possibly could until they couldn't do it anymore. One minute rest periods in between, and what we found was something that was pretty not unexpected, at least for, for, for me, um, given practical use. But what we found was that, that in, our, in our measures of cardiovascular responses, we found that there really wasn't any difference in almost any of the measures except that the auto-regulated condition appeared to blunt 
the exercise induced increases in arterial stiffness from the pulse wave velocity, which is considered the gold standard for measuring arterial stiffness, we found that that the autoregulation condition, so the 20 people that went through autoregulated BFR, um, that also went through the other conditions because it was a randomized crossover trial, but those individuals, their post-exercise arterial stiffness measure was statistically similar, whereas in the non-BFR condition and in the no BFR condition, they both statistically increased pre to post and also were statistically different from the post value of the auto-regulated condition. And that was extremely, extremely surprising. But there's a lot of questions with that measure. Um, for example, we don't necessarily know what are safe and acceptable increases in arterial stiffness. Number one, we know that exercise in general is beneficial. And we know that exercise in general is beneficial for people with comorbidities that may present with heightened arterial stiffness, like hypertension, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Um, they're all conditions that present with higher than we would expect relative to normotensive individuals or people without comorbidities, how they would present um, in terms of their pulse wave velocity. And so for those that, again, just summarizing the pulse wave velocity real quick, they basically take a measurement uh, on the aorta and then they put a measurement on the femoral artery and they measure how quickly the, um, the speed of wave propagation is from one point to the other. So the faster the speed, the greater the stiffness, and that has to do with the arterial properties or the arterial wall properties. And Dr. Werner was a guest on this podcast uh, when it launched. So if you're interested in understanding the dynamics of arterial stiffness, I refer you to that podcast. Um, so there's really no significant differences or at least clinically relevant differences in the um, in the cardiovascular responses other than the blunting of arterial stiffness in the, um, in the autoregulated condition. So then we move down to the per, uh, perceptual uh, responses. And in the perceptual responses, what we found was that the um, both BFR conditions exhibited similar perceptual responses, but they were both elevated, or at least the discomfort was elevated above the low intensity free flow. So this is in contrast to what the findings were from Jacobs et al that um, showed that the um, auto regulation produces or, or is less perceptually uh, demanding both from an exertion perspective, but also from a discomfort perspective than, um, than the non-autoregulated non condition. So this um, was, was, pretty, uh, was pretty surprising, right? Um, that the discomfort was the same. Um, we expected rating of perceived exertion was higher post-exercise um, and equal in all conditions. Why? Because they're exercising to volitional fatigue. And when you're exercising to volitional fatigue, your, your exertion is going to be maximal. Now, how much of the, uh, how much discomfort we should expect to experience should also be somewhat high, but BFR has the potential to heighten that. And if you were using the smart cuffs, for example, you would expect that discomfort might be a little bit less given the evidence. And if you're using the Delphi now, at least in the lower body, we showed that there is no difference between the exercise induced discomfort um, between conditions. And the exercise induced discomfort was relatively modest. Um, check in here what we, uh, what we found. Um, in terms of the RPD, um, it's, it's, uh, what we found was that the RPD was 
pretty high. Um, trying to look at the table. Supplementary material. One sec. So our rating of perceived discomfort was 6.2 to 6.3 out of 10, whereas the rating of perceived discomfort in no BFR um, was around five. And this was for men. For women, it was a little bit higher, um, six to seven in the BFR conditions and four in the non-BFR conditions. So it it really um, was moderately high and the discomfort was slightly lower with the uh, no BFR condition. So this study um, also showed that the, the amount of exercise volume performed was similar between the non-autoregulated condition and the autoregulated condition. We found that um, with four sets to volitional fatigue, we found that the autoregulated cuff condition did on average 53 plus or minus 20 reps. And the non-autoregulated condition did 52 plus or minus 17 reps. So they were statistically the same, but both were statistically lower than the no BFR condition, which was 83 plus or minus 27 reps. So the no condition had higher reps and a larger spread um, versus the BFR conditions. And that is, it again, in contrast to the findings of Jacobs et al. that showed that the um, that the, the auto-regulated cuff condition performed more repetitions. Now, why is that the case? Well, I said already before, the Delphi is a much more responsive auto-regulation device. It, it, its features are such that its motor is bigger, so it's able to adjust the pressure to a much finer degree and maintain that set interface pressure. And therefore, um, it did not impact performance, probably, although we didn't measure this, but probably because they weren't, it wasn't allowing blood flow to leave the exercising limb. And thus, it was able to maintain that restrictive stimulus a little bit more. We also, in our study, did not find a single adverse event, despite the fact that we did a familiarization session that randomized the participants to, to try to expose them to some BFR. Um, we exposed them to a non-autoregulated or autoregulated random. They didn't know, they were blinded, um, but we wanted to give them a taste of the protocol um, in the familiarization session, we didn't track any outcomes, um, but there was no adverse responses, not one. Um, so converse to Jacobs that showed that there was, uh, I believe 16 adverse events um, of which all were minor, right? Majority were, dis uh, were uh, dizziness. Um, we didn't find any in, in this study. So, so we kind of were left with, a little bit of a pause because we used a very strenuous protocol and none of our participants, none of our 20 participants really got um, any serious um, responses, you know, um, which is good. I mean, I think this highlights the, the, the safety profile of blood flow restricted exercise, even high in, higher intensities of blood flow restricted exercise. Now, I want to go and I want to uh, point out that the mean value of repetitions completed in our analysis was 53 and we had them do four sets to volitional fatigue. The commonly prescribed repetition scheme of 30 followed by three sets of 15 is 75 reps. So the, the over half of our participants did not achieve in either auto-regulated or non-auto-regulated condition, the 75 repetitions, such that this is another example of studies that are showing that failure exercise and the 30, 15, 15, 15 repetition scheme are, are similar. Um, I know in this study, it was 53 and 52, but other studies have, have shown about 80 or 70 reps in four sets to fatigue, so the volume is similar. And that got me thinking about what about the hypertrophy that results from these two? Could this be an explanation why the hypertrophy following 
a failure based routine or following a 30 15 15 15 protocol could be similar. So that was that study. Um, and you know, some limitations, right? We, we weren't powered to find sex differences. We weren't, um, we don't know the relevancy of the blunting of the arterial stiffness response. Um, it was, it was less than one meter per second, um, on average. And the only data that we do have shows that chronically increased, um, pulse wave velocities of greater than one meter per second increases cardiovascular risk, uh, morbidity and mortality. So there's, um, there's the chronic data, but that doesn't mean, and we all should respect and know that just because we have chronic data that shows one thing doesn't mean that acute stressors that increase pulse wave velocity, for example, don't lead to adaptations that over time will decrease carotid, uh, femoral pulse wave velocity. So this was the second true study on auto regulation. And, um, and this opens up the device features literature, because it really does show that auto regulation is a device specific feature. And you can't look at research that is using auto regulation and assume that the stimulus is going to be the same. That is the main takeaway from the existing published body of blood flow restricted research. Now I'm going to briefly talk about our follow up study that's not yet published as of June 24th, 2024. But what we wanted to know was does this pattern of auto regulation um, does that, uh, change in the upper extremity, right? Because the two, the two research papers that we have right now are on the lower body. So we did the same study design, right? We did a randomized crossover, um, crossover study, but we included 32 participants of which 21 were males and 11 females. So we wanted to include everyone that people that were physically active, 89% of our population reported resistance training three times a week. So these were um, largely recreate, uh, largely resistance trained, and we had individuals perform concurrent bilateral um, blood flow restricted bicep curls at 20% of the one rep max. And, um, and what we found was similar to the lower body, at least um, for performance, is that there was no difference in total repetitions performed between low intensity uh, BFR auto-regulated and low intensity BFR non-auto-regulated, but both were significantly less than the free flow control, which should make sense, right? We, I think we had about a 40 to 45% reduction in uh, total repetitions in the BFR conditions compared to the non BFR conditions. Um, so what we did find that shocked me a little bit was we actually found that the auto regulated condition in the upper body was actually perceived as more perceptually demanding. So the non auto regulated condition actually had um, a little bit reduced or RPE was, let me, let me rephrase this. So RPE was significantly higher. So rating of perceived exertion was significantly higher in the BFR auto regulated condition compared to the other conditions. So it was a higher uh, perceptual demand on exertion. So they had to work harder, even though they're getting to the same endpoint. And it was only about 0.53 out of 10. So it was, you know, significant 5% um, median difference or mean difference between the conditions, but it's still significantly more. And rating of perceived discomfort, so how uncomfortable the exercise was, was over a half uh, greater in the auto regulated versus the non auto regulated condition. And in comparison to the no BFR, it was two and a half points higher, suggesting that auto regulation 
in general is more uncomfortable and perceptually demanding in upper body BFR exercise to volitional failure than it is in the lower body where the perceptual demands appeared to be quite similar. So that was the perceptual and performance, but what about the, uh, what about the stiffness and the, the, the cardiovascular responses? Well, we actually found that really um, no changes in arterial stiffness was observed between any of the conditions. Um, in fact, we found that um, the only real significant changes were a decrease in central and supine diastolic blood pressure in all groups though, but it's really only about six millimeters of mercury. So it's really not too high. Um, and supine systolic blood pressure increased pre to post only in the no BFR condition, but only by about four millimeters of mercury. And again, this was after a rest period of 10 minutes because that's when it was taken with the arterial stiffness measures. Um, so it's interesting. We get a little bit of a divergent response to arterial stiffness in the upper body as we do in the lower body. Um, that is uh, interesting. And hopefully this paper uh, should be published in the near future. Um, but what we found wa was from a total volume perspective that we had about a 44 to 48% reduction in total exercise volume, which aligns with the existing body of research. So those are the main studies that have directly investigated autoregulation and whether or not autoregulation has the capacity to significantly increase the or change the acute responses to blood flow restricted exercise. So where does that leave us? Well, I think the big question or the big statement that we can make pretty much with some degree of certainty is that autoregulation is likely device specific and region specific. So we should anticipate that autoregulation is going to have a potentially different effect if we're using different cuffs that have autoregulation. So you can't extrapolate very easily the impact of autoregulation if you're just reading a particular study. Um, you have to then understand where what device is being used and what the protocol is and understand the device responsiveness is going to largely be the driver for how responsive the um the auto regulation feature is going to be which is then going to change how much um how much restriction it's going to be able to pr produce between the different phases of muscle contraction so i think that that's the biggest takeaway that we can that we can deliver here the second is that, and I'm not gonna really talk about this study, but we have another study that's in review that we use the same setup uh, for the Delphi wall squats. And we did show that auto that the Delphi condition, we didn't compare directly autoregulation and non autoregulation in that trial, um, but we did show for the second time that auto that the Delphi cuff blunted arterial stiffness increases pre to post exercise and the other conditions increased it. So there is something to the auto regulation function of the Delphi in the lower body during that particular exercise. Can we extrapolate it to other lower extremity exercises? Maybe, um, but that is an area that is ripe for future research to understand why the significance of arterial stiffness in general and then the impact of autoregulation on that arterial stiffness. So that's really the, the, the second takeaway. The third is that because autoregulation is a device specific feature, we can extrapolate to the perceptual demands of autoregulation with different cuffs, right? We saw that the Jacob study showed that, um, that the perceptual demands were less in autoregulated um, leg extensions to volitional fatigue and during the fixed, uh, I think they were largely the same, but 
but at, certainly during the failure routine, they um, experienced uh, less perceptual demand. So we can't extrapolate that finding to then the the studies that that were done with the Delphi that were showing that, wait, wait a second, we actually showed no difference in the lower body with our autoregulation versus non-autoregulation. But both in terms of discomfort were heightened relative to a low intensity free flow you know, control group that wasn't present in the Jacobs group, Jacobs study. They only did um, comparing auto and auto um, together. And then we show, we showed that and hopefully in a, in a, in a very uh, upcoming paper uh, in the upper body, bilateral concurrent bicep curl exercises that actually autoregulation increased the perceptual demands in the upper body. So it really is a crapshoot and it's something that, that needs to be respected when we're thinking about extrapolating results from different trials. What cuff is used is a, is a good thing that should be reported. What is that cuff auto-regulated? Okay, um, what kind of data do we have on the effectiveness of that auto-regulated cuff? We're going to need, you know, data on the mat up. We're going to need data on fit cuffs and their auto-regulated function. Um, we're going to need that data to help us make better understanding of the extrapolations that we can make with that research. So that's, that's the big kind of takeaways. Now, where do I see future directions? Well, number one, I think that we need to look at, at whether or not, um, auto-regulation produces a different outcome than non-auto-regulated train, uh, training. Now, we can't do that to failure because that would produce equivocal muscle growth. But what about in non-failure fixed repetition schemes? Like the recent paper that we published, the, the BFR reps paper, where three to four sets of 15 is probably producing the same amount of muscle growth as high load exercise, right? What if we then, then did a longitudinal trial over six to eight weeks looking at you know, twice a week, try to keep it as minimum of frequency as possible twice a week with a minimum volume of exercise and seeing does auto regulation impact the hypertrophic hypertrophic response to longitudinal training, right? My hypothesis or my guess is it probably doesn't, but I think that also depends on the responsiveness of the BFR cuff. If a cuff is less responsive, their autoregulation feature is less responsive. I'm going to anticipate that they're probably going to be less effective than a cuff that is more responsive in their autoregulation feature. So that is the big thing, longitudinal trials. The second is, is long-term discomfort attenuated relative? You know, so we understand that there is some degree of attenuation. It's not much, but there is a degree of attenuation to the perceptual demands of blood flow restricted exercise when performed over um, a, a series of weeks. Um, now, my question is, does autoregulation produce a better response or in the case of the upper body, does it actually, you know, continue to be elevated beyond non autoregulated conditions, right? Those are things that are important from a long term compliance perspective. Not to mention that the auto-regulated cuffs, specifically the ones that are very responsive, tend to be a lot more expensive. So we need to understand is the additional expense from an auto-regulated perspective, not just the fact that this, the, the cuff is, 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 is valid, meaning that it, it has been studied, it does apply the pressure it's supposed to apply. We have the Luke Hughes research that shows that it maintains a set interface pressure, which opens up another box of worms in my opinion, just because again, I don't necessarily think that that um, is the be all end all for other cuffs that don't auto regulate, right? Because we know that BFR works a ton of different ways, but with specific, uh, specific uh, relevance to auto regulation, I want to know is that discomfort attenuated or not and the participant preferences. Um, so we asked in our studies, what is your likelihood to perform this exercise again? And we didn't really find any differences in the likelihood to perform again between the BFR conditions in either study. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to note, and that's something that 
I'm interested in from a, a long-term compliance perspective. And then last, it's really the arterial stiffness relevancy. Like, what is it? I have no idea. Um, it's, it's an interesting question to, uh, to ponder. Well, I think we don't know a lot. I think we are starting to put the pieces together. I hope you enjoyed this podcast um, talking about auto regulation. We should have more information at the tail end of 2024 on the auto regulation feature. So stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, um, we have a, a course that is uh, over 11 hours of, of CEUs that you'll get. Um, you're going to get the most up-to-date information, including lectures on device features and characteristics. And it's updated once a year with the latest and greatest information on blood flow restriction. You can follow me on Instagram, the BFR Pros and the HPM. And again, I really appreciate all of your attention and join us next time. Thank you all. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.